Okay. Um, I'm going to crack it for tonight. Uh, I forgot my own webcam, uh, so I'm using the camera built into the election machine. It looks okay. Quality visuals. I am not sure how the audio is going to turn out. Traditional webcams are built in. The audio bit, speaking inside a biscuit tin type of sound, so uh, it might come out terrible. So tonight we need to look at two things. We need to look at the idea of uh, error processing and exceptions, and that's a means to an end, because then we're going to move on to text files. Text files is the main topic for tonight. So at the moment, what happens when a runtime error is detected? First of all, does everybody here know what a runtime error is? The clue is in the name. It's an error that happens when your code is running. So we have two types of errors in programming. We have compile time errors, which are usually syntactical. I've left out a semicolon, I've left out a bracket, I've left out something. I've got system with a lowercase f. Something kind of ruins the grammar of my program, and as a result, it won't let me. It gives me a compile error. It won't even get to the point of letting me run a file. The other type of errors we have are runtime errors, and what they will do is they will compile OK. They'll let you run the program, but then something's going to happen in the middle of the program where it crashes. Uh, most common ones for you guys are going to be things like arithmetic errors, division by zero, uh, input mismatch errors, you ask for an integer, you enter in A, uh, or array index out of bounds errors. They're probably the most common ones you've come across so far. There are a whole range of them, but they're the most common ones. So at the moment, what happens when a runtime error is detected? Well, our program crashes, and it finishes. It brings you back to the command prompt. That's not ideal. That, that leaves us with this scenario of something's happened, and it's irrecoverable. We can't get back to handling that, that problem inside the code. It goes, no, nope, can't do this, and it crashes. The second issue we have to look at is, well, where does the program handle this error? Um, when you, if I click on this for a moment, and click a really quick program. When you create uh, a Java program, Here, let's say I create a really quick uh, integer array called A that is a new integer array that has seven elements inside it. And then I call method and I send in A. That's your round brackets. And inside here, I say, okay, um, A9 is equal to 10. Okay? Okay, so here's a really, really simple Java program. Um, we're going to create a method, main method, create a new array, it's got seven elements in it, send that array to this method, this method tries to access index nine. We can all see there's gonna be a problem with that code. It'll compile fine. So if I save this, and I open up my command prompt, on my desktop, I can compile this. And compiles fine, that's why there's no syntactical error, grammatically it's correct. But when I try to run it, no, yeah. it gives me this issue here. So, okay, so first of all, <clears throat> a runtime error has happened. Array index out of bounds. So, that answers our first question. What happens when a runtime error happens? Program crashes. <laughs> And then where does it deal with it? And that's the next two lines of text we have here. And sometimes you'll see it's not just two or three lines of text telling you uh, lines of code that this problem is. It can be nine or ten. I've done some programs where I've had a runtime error, and I've had maybe 15 lines. And it were files I've never even written, like stuff that's internal to Java. And it's going, oh, okay, we're trying to solve it here and here and here. So essentially what's saying is, 
the error first occurred on line nine. So if we have a look, line nine is going to be here where we actually tried to put the value in. And we couldn't fix it there. So then we traced it back to line four. And line four is where I called my method up here. And at that point, we are at the main method, which is basically the root of our program. It's the beginning point of our program. There's nowhere further I can go back there. So we tried handling the problem inside method. That didn't work. We then tried handling the problem inside main. That didn't work. So we had no alternative. We crashed the program. So there are the two questions that we're looking at. What happens when a runtime error occurs for us at the moment? Crashes our program. And where does the program handle the error? Well, it depends where the error occurs. If the error occurs inside main, it can try handling it inside main and then it'll just crash immediately. If it's inside another method, it'll try handling it in that method first. And if that doesn't work, it'll go back to the, net, the method that called that, and maybe the method that called that, and maybe the method that called that, until it gets back up to the main method. And if none of those methods have a facility for handling that error, it'll just crash the program. Okay. What we want to look at in looking at exceptions is how can we get around that? Okay, so our program does nothing, uh, in which case it's going to um, force the program to finish. Uh, the program is going to execute statements that's going to display the error message. So the program encounters a runtime error and goes, oh, this is, there's something wrong here. I need to fix this. Let me check to see if there's any code that can fix it. There isn't any code that can fix it. Okay, let me give the user as much information as I can. So it'll tell you what error has happened, and then it tries to tell you where it's attempted to fix that. So you can see there, that's the line nine and the line four from our previous example. So there are two scenarios that we're coming across at the moment, and the one that we wanna look at is the program recovers from the error and continues to execute. That's what we're gonna look at tonight. And that's something called exception handling. Exception handling is a way of saying, here's a block of code, and something might go wrong here. So if something goes wrong, here is your backup plan. Here's what to do in case of an emergency. We've all seen, yep, the little red box down the, the, down the end of the room, the fire alarm box. In case of an emergency, break glass. So everything should go fine. But if a fire starts in the room, someone go down and break the glass in that box. So we have instructions. We know what to do when there's an error. So let's look at an example. So here, the example we're going to look at here is where we have a method main, which is going to call another method f, and inside method f, it's going to call method g. And the error is going to occur in g. So we're going to see how it trickles back up through the problem. So here's our test class, or our main class. Um, we have these printout statements, and we can see how far we've got into our program before it crashes. So we get the printout at the very start, start of main. It then calls method f. When method f is finished, it should call end of main. Inside our method f, we say we're at the start of f. We attempt to call method g. Method g should execute, and when it's finished, we'll go end of f. When f finishes, it goes back to the main method and prints out end of main. Inside method g, we print out start of g, and here is where we have our code that's going to cause a problem. Int x, x is equal to 5 divided by 0. That's immediately going to go cause a problem because it's a division by 0, by, it's a division by zero problem. Um, if for some reason this doesn't cause an error, it'll print out end of g. So if this code were to work correctly, the output from this program should be start of main, Start of F, start of G, end of G, end of F, end of May. Okay, that's what should happen. What's actually going to happen is that. Start of May, we haven't got to the area yet. Start of F, we haven't got to the area yet. Start of G, we haven't got to the area yet. Exception in thread May. Okay, arithmetic exception, division by zero. So we know what type of error it is. Initially, we encountered it in line 21, which is method G. Then we encountered, we, tried, we encountered it again in line 13, that's method F, and then we encountered it again in line 6, that's method A. We can see that chain of responsibility working its way back up. It's going to go, I have no code here to fix this. Let me hand it up to whoever calls me. They must be more important, more robust. They know how to deal with this. Let's hand it back up there. Oh, they have no code to fix that either. 
Right, let's hand it back up. And this keeps going back up and up and up until we get to main. And main is your, your ultimate responsibility. If main doesn't have the facility to handle this, well then, we're in trouble. So let's see how we do this. An exception is this type of runtime error. You can see that all of these error messages, the one we had initially was array index out of bounds exception. Uh, for some of the zombie dice programs I saw during the development period, I saw a null pointer exception. Here we have arithmetic exception. So exceptions are those runtime errors. Something weird's happened. The code looked okay, but when we were running it, something unusual happened. What we want to do is something called exception handling, which inside modern programming languages generally boils down to a structure called a try-catch block. Okay, We're going to look at it a little bit here in first year, and then we're going to come back to it again in second year for the object oriented class to look at it in more depth. The only reason why we're looking at it this year is because we cannot do file access without exception handling. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So, yeah, what, yes. what is uh, the error of 21 down? You usually see it uh, 6, 30, and 21 force, wouldn't you? Or is that is there any particular reason? It, it's having a, an error at 921. Yep. Yep. And I have to. So it goes from. Uh, where are we? No, that's that's the way it, that that's the, it, it, it does it does go that order. It works its way back up. Now, what may happen if you've come across these errors before is they may not all be the same file. So I've seen people where they've uh, they've called like system.out.print and they've sent in some very weird thing there that's caused a crash. So it might be line fifty-eight in their program, but it's line five hundred in the actual system.out file. So maybe that's where you see it jumping out. But traditionally, if you've written all the code, it starts at where it actually occurred, which is line twenty-one, which is here. And then it goes up to the where that method was called, which is line 13. And then it goes up to where the next method would call, which is line 6. So it's working its way back up to main. OK, so the try-catch block is a way of housing our code, putting a container around our code. And um, so here is our method G. We've rewritten it. We have, still have that. That's the same as last time. We still have declared our integer. That's the same as last time. But we have this block here, try. We open up our curly braces, and we have x equal to 5 divided by 0. So whatever's inside the curly braces of the try block has the possibility of a runtime exception. Um, and so we can put this around it. And then what we can have inside it is a catch block. So if you think about it, um, imagine our code is very temperamental. It, it's not intangible. It's a physical thing. It's a robot of some sort. There's an error with this. Throw it out. And before it gets thrown, something catches it, which is this block here. And the catch block allows us to handle the error the way we as the programmer see fit. Now, for first year, we're going to do a really facetious way of doing that. We're essentially going to say, here's the error, and end the program. We're not going to handle the error at all. We're doing the absolute bare minimum to get file access up and running. But inside here, you could have, if division by zero didn't work, you could have, okay, well, then x is equal to zero. You could, you could have a default value. Let's attempt this. This doesn't work. Let's set a value as a kind of a, a default. You could have a way of um, input mismatch exception. Please enter in an integer, and you enter in a double. You could have a way of taking their input and truncating it down to an integer data type. You could have a way of taking their input and go, that's not an integer, it's a string, it's something else, and you could just put in the value of zero. Okay, so the, so the code that goes inside your catch block is for you, the programmer, to decide what to do. For first year, all we're going to do is say e.get message. So the exception, the issue that happened here, we're just going to get the message. So now what's going to happen, and then we have end of G at the end. Now what's going to happen when we run the code is we've got start of main, start of F, start of G in the catch block. So we know that something has gone wrong because we get to this line here. The next line is our get message, which is division by zero. 
but our code hasn't crashed. So it attempts to do this calculation, it attempts to do the five divided by or zero, five divided by zero. That doesn't work. Here's how to handle that. Let's go continue running the rest of the program. So we run this line here, goes back up to F, runs end of F, goes back up to main, runs end of main. Our program didn't work, but it did not crash. And that, in its essence, is what exception handling is. Okay? The reason why I'm showing you this now is because for text files, you're reaching outside of your code into another file. Sorry into another file that you may not have written. It may not be on your machine. It may not be on your network. And because of that, the Java construct requires you to have a certain element of robustness, of contingency. So if it's on your machine, if you wrote the code, if you wrote the file, then you're, you're pretty confident. Yeah, this is going to be here. I know it's going to be there. I know because I wrote it a moment ago. But Java doesn't know that. So you might be confident as a developer, but Java doesn't know that. So it forces you to put this try block and catch block in. But whenever you reach outside your program, you have to do it in the construct of our try catch. That's why I'm going to go through this stuff. And we'll come back to it. And it's very, very simple. It's kind of, if you want to access a file, whether you're reading to it or writing, sorry, re reading from it or writing to it, it goes inside a try block. And that try block is going to say, if it goes wrong, you're going to print out something went wrong, and you're going to finish the program. That's all. Um, note that here, even though in the previous <coughs> output here, we can see it goes from method G to method F to main, we handle the error where it occurs. It's not necessary to do that. What we could have done is handle our error inside main method. So we could have our try and catch block here. So when we get to the method G, the old version of method G and an error happens, well, it'll crash that method. It'll go back up to method F. It'll effectively crash that method. It'll go back up to method G, or sorry, to method main, and it'll be caught here as a print out the message. And so the output we get then is that. Start of main, start of F, start of G. We have our division by zero, that causes an error. G doesn't get to finish. There's no code inside of F. F doesn't get to finish. Main has the ability to handle that code. So we print out the message, division by zero, and then we finish off the main method. From a syntactical point of view, that is absolutely valid. You can do that. You can have, whenever you call a method inside your program, you could have a try catch block around it inside main. And if there's ever an error, you get to see what the error is about your program actually crashing. From the point of view of programming ethic, this is terrible. Okay, it's the shrugging of responsibility. And because as your code gets more complex, as your programs get larger, you're more than likely going to be working inside teams. You don't want to be known as the person who never deals with the problems that their code causes, and someone else has to handle it higher up. Okay? So you should always, this won't cause a compile error. This will work. But it's just, it's poor practice. It's much more responsible. It's much better to say, okay, well, if there's a runtime error here, so I'm going to handle the issue inside the method where it occurs. It means that if in a future version of this method, we figure a way of around this, we can just remove the try catch here. And it doesn't affect anybody else's methods. Remember that the methods are all meant to be connectable like Lego. So if I'm connecting a new block onto the stack that I'm making, it shouldn't have to augment an existing block on that stack. Does that make sense? Okay. That's literally all I have on exceptions. Like I said, for first year, we are not looking at much for exceptions. We're looking at it as a means to an end. And the reason why we're looking at the means to an end is we are forced to have try catch block around any piece of code that reaches outside of our Java file. And for this week and for next week, 
we are going to be doing that. We're going to be using text files this week and then binary files next week. So this is also a short enough slide deck, and I'm not going to go through all the tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do all the stuff I have to do, so you can see the commands, and then I was going to build a couple of examples so you can see them it's working. Okay. So text files. Um, file. Imagine a, a file in which each character is represented by a binary code. So the text editor has displayed the characters uh, of this code. So if we had a file called t1.txt, hit a nine, the code for nine, and then the followed by the code for zero, followed by a new line character, followed by the code for seven, and so on. So our txt file would look like this. It would just be a text file that's got 90, 73, 87, 96, 91. A plain text file is any file that you can open up in Notepad or Notepad++ and read it without any other interpretation. So text files are files of the extension TXT. They are also our Java files, our HTML files, our CSS files, our JavaScript files. Um, you're using Git at the moment, so it's your Git ignore, it's your MD files, it's your uh, bash commands if you've got any of those, it's a shell script, .sh file if you have any of them. It's any file that you can open up and read the text. So text files are a huge range of files. Okay. Non-text files are called binary files. And they're files where if I open them up inside Notepad++, I can't really make sense of it. So they're Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, Excel sheets, MP3 files, MP4 files, um, JPEGs third-party proprietary uh, files from, let's say, 3D Studio Max or from uh, well, actually Unreal Engine at all. But if you're like an EXE file, is a binary file. You can't look inside and see what the code of that is, okay? Um, we're going to learn how to write to both types of files. Text files is very simple. We're going to treat everything like a string. So all we need to worry about is accessing that file, getting content from that file, and then once we get the content, it's a string. So it's easier to handle. The way we access our file is by reusing our scanner object. The scanner object is fantastic. It is it's a reasonably new addition to Java. Uh, up until 2000, 2015, I think it was introduced. Maybe 2014. It was introduced. Uh, before that, you have to start using system buffers to actually get the data into the programs. Getting the data out has always been a uh, system knowledge. That's been there since 2006 onwards. Uh, but getting information into the program has always been a little bit trickier. And so you'd see, I mean, even uh, we had a previous lecture here, Tony Mullins, you'll see his book up in the library. He custom wrote a keyboard and screen class when he first published the book in 2001 to make life easier for students. So you just had screen.print or keyboard.read and it handle all that buffering for you. Um, Java have realized as an organization, hey, we should be uh, a little more user friendly and get, allow for users to have a, a, at least a, a, a sensible path to get information in. So they made this scanner object here. So far, when we've created scanner, what's been inside the bracket here has always been system.in. And system.in points at the keyboard on your local machine. But that's not only where we can point to. You can see here, I have a file. And I'm pointing my scanner at that file. I could create an array and pass the scanner into that. Uh, or pass that into the scanner, sorry. I could create, um, there, there's multiple structures that you can do. You can feed information in. And basically what a scanner is, it's a buffer processing unit. You can load up the scanner with a bunch of content, and then it starts taking sections out depending on what commands you use until that buffer is empty, and then you can fill the buffer up again, and you can take more information out. So when you've typed on the keyboard, and you've entered in five, six characters, 20 characters, 2,000 characters, and you've hit the return key, you have filled up the buffer. When you hit the return key, it takes in the value, and then what you do is you put that value into a variable, into a string, into an inch, or whatever it might be. And then 
that data is inside your program. You just process it as that variable. With a file, we kind of do the same thing. We are going to create a file or file object here. We're going to point it at an actual file on our computer. And we're going to look, point our scanner at that. And what our scanner is going to do is it's going to attempt to open that file. Does that file exist in that location? If it does, open it up and read in all of the contents. And the scanner, the buffer, fills up. And once it's filled up, we can process through it as the program or whatever, whatever way we fit, feel free. Two different ways of doing it. Over two lines, we declare the, the file object and then put the file object by its variable name into the scanner. Or over one line, where we have scanner's new scanner, which is a new file, and then we put that in there. I don't mind what you use. They basically both take the same method processing time, the same process footprint, the same method storage. It's preference. It, it's like, do you create int x semicolon and then x is equal to 5, or do you go int x is equal to 5 semicolon? Much and much as <clears throat> Our file name is in quotation marks. Okay? And our file name is dependent on where it's located on the computer. The way I've written the file name there, with just the name of the file, I am assuming that that file is in the same location as my dot class file for my program. If it's anywhere else, you need to use a fully qualified path. So if you're on a Windows machine, that's going to be C colon backslash backslash users backslash whatever your name is backslash whatever. You're, so build up to full. So if it's on your desktop and your Java code isn't actually on your desktop, it's somewhere else, you need to give it the full description. It doesn't have the intelligence to search your hard drive for it. Okay? Um, for every example we're going to do, for every code piece of code you're going to hand up to me where we're using a text file, I'm going to assume it's in the same folder. If you are not using Notepad++, if you're using something like Eclipse or IntelliJ or NetBeans where it creates a folder or a project hierarchy for you, it may put that text file somewhere else. That's fine. Just be aware of it when you actually write your code. Okay, so that's how we access the file. This is the bit that we need our exception handling for. So this is the bit where it reaches outside of the uh, it reaches outside of the Java file. And if there's a problem, it's going to occur as it's reaching out to get that content. Here's a quick example where we are going to take um, user input and then we're going to let the user define what file we're looking for. So we have a, uh, we have a scanner up here. Now this scanner is pointed at system.in, which means it's a keyboard scanner. It's only going to take an in input from the keyboard. I'm going to prompt the user. Please enter a file name. I'm going to take the value in. And I've created a brand new scanner here which is pointed at the file that the user's entered in. Two things here. First thing, when you have a scanner pointed at a different source of information, you need a brand new scanner. Up until now, if you've had one piece of input from the keyboard or 200 pieces of input from the keyboard, you would reuse the same scanner. And the reason why you're able to do that is the information is coming from the same source. This scanner is pointing at a different source of information. It's not pointing at the keyboard, it's pointing at the actual uh, file on the hard drive. So uh, we need a brand new scanner for that, that's fine. The second point, we are being super trusting of our user here. We've said, hey, enter in a file name, and we've taken it in. And from where we've taken it in to where we try to access it, there's no code here to check. Have they spelled it correctly? Have they got the extension in? Have they matched case? If it's class list, capital C, capital S, have they spelt it that way? Or have they gone all lowercase or all uppercase? Have they typed text, T, X, T? Have they typed the words text, T, E, X, T? Are they on a Linux system where they just didn't bother putting in an extension? Are they a really new users or a new Windows user where the extensions are all hidden? And there's, oh, that's, that's called a new file. Have they put in spaces? There's, there's an awful lot of stuff where we've been very, very trusting of our user here. I won't ask you to ask the user to take the file name in because I don't trust the users. 
if you look at how modern um, pieces of software deal with that, if I want to open up a new file, it doesn't give me anywhere. Well, I suppose I could start typing here if I wanted to, but immediately it gives me a browser. No, 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 no. You don't type the name. You pick the file you want because I don't trust you to type correctly. That's essentially what this interface is saying to you. We are not. We don't have the luxury in console to pop up a browser here so they can select the file they want to deal with. Um, but we are not going to go down the path of having uh, the user enter in the file name. We're going to hard code the file name for pretty much every tab we want to do. Okay, so let's assume they've typed the file name correctly and they've got in here. And um, what we have now is we have this loop. And the guard in this loop is has next int. So all this file has is it's the file from our very first slides. It's a series of integers, each in a new line. Has next int is going to return back a Boolean value, a true or a false. It's having um, it's having a look to see if there's anything left in that buffer. And if there is, well then we're allowed to start the loop. And the first thing we do is we go next int. And next int is actually taking that out of the buffer. And very much like a PEZ dispenser, you open up the lid. Oh, I can see a sweet in there. Take the sweet out. That's no longer in there, and everything underneath it pushes upward like a stack, so that we're slowly emptying, emptying that buffer. And um, so this is a very simple example here. We are going to open up a file. We're going to check if there's any content in the file. While there's, con uh, while there's content in that file, we're going to read the integer in. We're going to print it to the screen. We're going to keep going around until we've printed out all of the contents of that file. And the last thing we do is we close our scanner. Up until now, we haven't ever closed scanners. Okay, we've created our, and you know that here in this example, I close my in file scanner. I don't close my KB scanner. When you're dealing with files, when you're dealing with stuff that's not inside this Java program, the common etiquette is that you close off all of those access facilities, all the objects that will reach outside. You close them off to allow uh, well, there's a couple of reasons for it. One, uh, when we're coming to writing content to a file, it's required, otherwise the content isn't actually written. And when we're reading from a file, it's good programming practice because it can lead to weird errors every now and again, where it locks a file, and then it's held in memory for some reason, that file, the access to that file, so no one else is allowed to get right access to it. And if you imagine uh, you're working in your office, and you're working on some sort of report, and you open up the file, and you write your super important paragraph, two paragraphs, two pages, whatever it might be, and then you go off for a long lunch, and you're gone from one to three, but you left that file open, so it's locked, no one else can write it. And everyone else is on your team who has to write their super important pieces of information. Don't have access to the newest version of that. At best, they can access the previous version. That's why we want to close our files when we finish using them. Okay, and um, we don't bother closing the scanner for keyboard because it's the keyboard in front of us. It's pretty unlikely that that's going to get locked by a, by a, by a piece of software by our program. We can, but as you since you no one's come across an error, but I can't. I ran my Java program and now I can't type on my keyboard. It's a very very small likelihood that it will ever actually lock the keyboard, and it doesn't give you for a fraction or two of a second. So there's a very simple example. Okay? Created a scanner, it's pointed at a file, it's pointed at the name of the file we want to access. If this goes okay, well then we have get into the loop where the loop says, is there anything in this file? And if there is, we go in, we take one piece of information out, we print it out the screen, and we keep going back up and checking until that file is empty. And you'll see that because we're using a scanner, we keep the language we're used to. Next int has next int, next double, next line. We can reuse a lot of those, okay? Because they all do the same thing. Read in from the buffer, 
the next string, the next integer, the next double, whatever it might be. If I want to write to a file, I can't use a scanner. In the same way when we're printing out to the screen, we don't use scanner, we use system.out.print. Here, if I want to write to, the, to a file, I use a, a command called a print writer. And that print writer is going to be pointed at a file that I want to access. And again, I can tell from this file that the location of this file is in the same folder as my Java program. Um, what we do here is <clears throat> we have our outfile.println. So print and println exist for print writer, and they work exactly the same way as system.out. We pass in this integer. It gets written to this text file, and it moves down a new line. And it keeps doing that until we our loop expires here. At the very end, we are going to close our print writer. When you're writing to a file, closing the file at the very or closing the print writer at the very end is incredibly important. When I talked about the scanner, I explained that it was a buffer. It's something that you fill up with information, and then your program takes chunks out as you're going out. Well, the print writer basically works in the opposite way. Your program is going to send information into a buffer, and that buffer is going to grow and grow and grow. When that buffer gets to a certain size, or when a certain time period has passed by, it will send a chunk of information actually out to the file. But to reduce the overhead, to reduce the writes out to our file on our hard drive, there's a gap. It doesn't write. So every, if we have 100 numbers here we're going to write, it's not writing 100 individual numbers. It will fill up the buffer, and then it might write 15, or it might write 20, or it might write all 100 in one go, depending on how long our buffer is set for. When your program is finished, if you don't run this piece of code, and then if you leave out that line of code, your code will still work. It will still compile. But when you go to open up your text file, you'll probably notice that there is no content inside that text file. The reason why there's no content inside that text file is because the buffer filled up, but it didn't fill up enough that it was full and it needed to empty some of it into the text file or the time period that it took to fill the buffer wasn't long enough for it to automatically push it out to the text file. So you have this buffer here, content inside it. Our program finishes. We've never run this last line of code here. The Java virtual machine goes, oh, well, this has not been used anymore. It gets rid of it. We don't want that. So by calling outfile.close or printwriter.close, it forces us to push all of that content out to our text file and to save the text file. Does that make sense? We are almost at the end of the slides. Okay, so writing to a file, reading from a file. But there's something missing here. I started off this lecture talking about exception handling and our try catch block. And none of my code has a try catch in it yet. So none of this code would actually work. If I took this code here, I went to compile it, it would tell me that you can't do this because uh, you need to catch this exception. Or possible exception, it needs to be thrown or caught. All right, so I need a way of adding in my exception handling. And we also saw that our exception handling should be as, as specific as possible. What I mean by that is it should be around the try block should be around the smallest amount of code as possible. If you have it around your entire program, it's really, really blunt. Um, have you ever been in your house and you had to unscrew a screw? Okay, and you don't go and get a screwdriver. You get a butter knife, or for the small screw, you get like a steak knife with a point of entry. You try doing that. And usually, if you're lazy like me and you need to change fuses and plugs or something, put batteries in kids' toys, stuff like that, you end up using the knives, and eventually all the tops of your knives are kind of they're corroded. You've, you've, you've bent off the chromium or the stainless steel on it. You have actually warped the edge of the, of the top of the steak knife so they aren't straight and they're off to the side to the pressure you're putting them. That's a really blunt instrument. Okay? 
For and, and if you look at the, the, the actual heads of the screws, you start to round them out. If they're Phillips head, if they're the cross, and you're you're using the, an incorrect tool for it, it'll go from an across shape to kind of almost like a St. Brendan's cross. That's the cross with the circle around in the center of it. If you keep using it, it's just a dot. You can't, you, you, you can't unscrew that ever again. Whereas if you've got the correct tool, if you're more specific about what you want to, so the correct Phillips head screwdriver and the correct size Phillips head screwdriver. I don't have my glasses with me today, but if you have glasses, the screw on the, the hinge of that is very, very small. You usually have to get special tiny screwdrivers for it. You can't use a massive electrician screwdriver for, let's say, screwing in the mounting for the projector up there. It wouldn't fit or it would just mangle the screw. So we want to be as specific as possible in our exception handling. The lunch instruments, they kind of work, but they never work as good as they could. And so we want to be as specific as we can. And so here's how we're going to do that. If our method, we're back to our method F, but now our method F is going to try to read from a file. Okay, so we declare our scanner up here. We set it equal to null. We open our try block. We take our scanner variable, and then we say is equal to new scanner, file.new, txt. And then we have our exception handling here. And because we're dealing with files, it's an IO exception, input output exception, as opposed to an arithmetic exception. A couple of things. Null is a way of initializing an object, initializing a thing, without putting a value inside it. You're going to learn more about this in the second year when you start looking at object oriented development and, and the idea of encapsulation and instantiation. Um, but if I set up a scanner with temporary values here, it affects some programming rules if I then want to change those values later on. I essentially need to create a brand new scanner if I want to change them. So null is our initialization value. Because our scanner object is created outside of the try catch block, it means that if this part here is successful, and I get down to, let's say, the, uh, well, the ellipses down here, the rest of the code, I can actually use this. If it's unsuccessful, I'm assuming my catch block is going to quit the program. If I moved the scanner here, so my actual declaration of the variable inside try, because of our curly braces here, our scanner wouldn't exist outside of the try block. So the, the modern way, then the normal way that we're going to do this is that we're going to create, we're going to declare our scanner here, but we don't initialize it. We just say, hey, it's equal to null. And then inside our try block is where we actually reach out to the, the other file, the text file on our hard drive. And it's where we're going to try to um, make that link, load the file into our program. And if that works, great. If it doesn't work, well, then there's an error here. We jump into this code here and handle it in whatever way it's been defined. And if we're allowed, we continue running the rest of the program. But sometimes we might have code in here that tells us to stop the program. So let's look at a more detailed example. Okay, so if we don't use the null, here's what's gonna happen. We declare our scanner, we're gonna try to but we don't initialize it here, so we haven't got it set to null. Here's where we initialize it. Um, if we get into the catch block, it says, well, file mightn't exist. But the problem is, if we don't ever set it to a starting value, well, then when we try to read in the next int, it might be pointing to anything. It might, it might be undefined, okay? So inside programming, undefined, is very different to null. Null literally means empty. There is no information in there. It is the correct shape, it's the correct structure. So last week we looked at the idea of objects So our, and our classes. So a class is a definition of structure. How many variables, what shape does it look like? Null basically means the outline's there, we just haven't put any data inside. It hasn't been set up with its first values. But undefined means I have no idea what this is. So I can't give you any information on it. So this is where we may get an issue. It's why we need to use the null at the start of it by using our null value there. 
which will allow us to fix our issues. Okay, um, I talked about inside our catch block, we may choose to exit our program. If we want to do that, we can use this command here, system.exit. Um, I haven't got around to looking at your zombie dice code just yet, but did anybody use system.exit in their code? Did anyone have a menu where you had a quit option? No, okay, fine. So the full timers did. Um, so system.exit is the way of shutting down your, your program. Okay, we haven't had to use it yet because we haven't had any code that required a menu, but also the way we are writing our code, it naturally stops and quits once it's done all of the commands inside that program. System.exit is where you're gonna have a, a premature exit. You're gonna say, oh, well, we're not finished doing all the instructions we've left in this file, but we're gonna finish up now. The value that goes inside the bracket represents why we exit. So if you are, and again, this is not gonna come up in assessment, it's just for, I suppose, for future knowledge. If you go system.exit zero, it means Everything is absolutely fine. The user has chosen the option to quit. So if you've got a menu, we've got option one, option two, option three, option four, quit. That would be system.exit zero. This is an, an expected shutdown of the program. A non-zero value means it's an unexpected. Something's gone wrong, and it's a, it's a bad enough issue that we know this code can't continue, so we're gonna actually quit the program early. We're forcing the program to quit. The reason why I say a non-zero as opposed to one is because there is ways of getting the number out of the exit log to work out the category of what went wrong. As our programs get bigger, as they get more complex, there can be multiple reasons why we want to exit our program. And so we might have one for, let's say, file not found, two for input mismatch error, three, four, arithmetic exception. So when you quit the program, you can, oh, what's, what's the, have you ever had a, like a Java, not a Java program, have you ever had a Windows program crashing you that gives you the error code? That's a really simple version of it. The, the, the reason for that is you should be able to take that error code and go to your developer documentation, your API, your manual, the uh, manufactured website, and categorize, oh, well, this is happening because, now, if it's a Windows, it's usually not single digit, it's usually a whole series, it's, it's, it's like a hexadecimal code, and it means you need to go off and look it up, and they have their knowledge base that says, this is because the driver for your Wi-Fi, or whatever it might be. Um, but it's the same idea. It's giving you some extra information as the machine is, or as the, the piece of software is, is crashing. Okay, so the rest of this, is an example. So I'm going to, and then there's one little thing about adding onto the file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit out of this. What time is it? Oh, it's the time. And I'm going to do an example here. So I'm going to delete this because um, this is very simple. Got nothing to do with text files. So a couple of things. If we're dealing with text files, we need to have import statements. So we have import.java.util. And this is for our scanner, okay? And then we have import Java, where is it? IO. And this is for file and print writer, okay? So we need, we need these two imports when we're actually using File access. If you don't have the two imports, it's not going to work. So these two here um, are going to allow you to do that. I'm going to do it all in the main method, so I can get rid of that. And I get rid of this stuff here as well. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to create. Um, I'm going to create a program that is actually there's a worksheet up on. Um, da, da, da. There's a worksheet up on Moodle. Let's go through those two questions. Well, let's go through one of them to begin with. Okay. So here's our first question here. Uh, create a program that takes in a list of names from the keyboard. The program should stop asking for uh, names when end of class has been entered in as the last string. You should take all of those names and save them to a text box. Let's go with that because that's a nice, simple one to start off with, and then we'll work on to the, the second one. So what we're going to do, 
is we're going to create a scanner. When you scanner now, because we have keyboard inputs, we're going to call it KB for keyboard. And we can set that up here because we know that's not going to cause an issue. Meaning kind of a try catch block around it. Okay. Uh, we also are going to need to have a print writer. Uh, and we'll call this PW. And we'll set that equal to null to begin with because this is the bit that we need to initialize inside our try catch block. Okay. Um, I'm going to create my try block here. And I'm going to say PW is equal to new print writer. And I'm going to put in a file here, and let's call it classlist.txt. When we're using the print writer, if the file doesn't exist, so I'm going to save this piece of code. Oh, it's already saved on my desktop. So if I have a look at my desktop here, uh, you can't see that, so let's open up desktop here. A few extra dry cuts. Okay, right. There is no text file there called classlist.txt. There's no text file at all on my desktop. I have two files, Java and a class file, and then I have a folder, and then I have the usual shortcuts. Okay. If I don't have a text file, and I try to write to a text file, it's not ideal, but, ja but the print writer has a backup, which essentially says, okay, if it doesn't exist, make it. Okay, so if, if this file does not exist, create a brand new file called whatever I put inside here, so classlist.txt, and start writing to that. The same is not true for if I want to read from a file. Okay, if I want to read from a file and that file doesn't exist, it's going to throw an exception. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. Okay, um, here I'm going to have a, oh, I need a string. Okay. String s is equal to empty. Okay, so here I'm going to have while s dot equals end of class. Uh, and actually, do you know what? It's not that. I don't want it to equal it. I want it to be anything but that. So while while not equal to end of class, I'm going to ask the user to enter in a value, print, and let's see. Enter a name. I'm going to take that name in from the user. So s is equal to kb dot uh, next line. And then I'm going to write that file, or write that line. To my print writer. Okay, so take the name in, write it out to the text file. That's all I need in my loop to begin with. When I finished this loop, I must have typed end of class. That's how this is going to finish. So when I finish that, I know that I'm not sending any more input into my program. So then I can close my print writer. As soon as I close that print writer, I can end my try block because I don't need anything else. So here I can then open up my catch block. This is going to be a IO exception. We'll call it E. And here is the incredibly basic message that we're going to put inside every one of our exceptions for first year. It does not matter what type of exception it is. This line of code here is all I ever expect you to do for an exception, okay? With the possible exception of quitting the program. So if in your next assignment, it's gonna involve reading and writing to text files, reading from and writing to text files. So if you have an issue with reading from the text file, let's say you're loading up some information, it's possible then you might wanna quit the program. So you might use your system exit. Actually, that's, that's true on system exit. You might then want to have system dot exit and something went wrong, so we'll say one here. Uh, but that's 
That's the extent of it. It's always going to be an I.O. exception because we're dealing with files. We always want to print out the message. And sometimes we'll want to quit. Okay. So let's save this. Uh, let's go here. Java C uh, test. Java test. Okay, so enter a name. Um, so we got Owen, Mary, Joe, Dave, Susan, Jane, end of class. Our code finishes. Okay, that's fine. There's actually that program there is interactive. You could have done that last week. There's nothing really new there. But if I go back to my explorer, I can now see that here. I have a new file. It's got 50 bytes in size. It was created at one minute past seven, which we are just at now. And if I open up that file, I can see that I have the same list of names that I entered in here over there. Okay, so that's writing to a file. Uh, we'll ignore the end of class part, because technically I don't want that there, but for the moment we'll ignore that. We'll loop back around and see how to fix that in a moment. Um, the print writer is very, at the moment, it's very blunt. The print writer will open a file if it exists and wipe all of the contents inside that file, or it'll create a brand new file for you and it'll write whatever your program writes into it. So if I were to run that code again, let me shut down this one. Here. So if I was to run that code again, and I just enter in Owen, and then I go end of class. So I have one name in there. If I go back to my file, you can see now that this one here is it's actually zero bytes. It's so small, it's it's not even registering a size in this. But if I open it up, it's got one word in there. It's wiped all of the prior contents in there. Now we'll look in a couple of minutes to see how to get about that, but it's very, very basic. Um, it's very blunt in how it works. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's my print writer. Rather. If I want to then open up my program or open up my, um, my file there, and let's say, tell me how many students are in the class. So I'm going to read entry the file and count how many names I have inside it. Um, what I can do then is I can create a brand new uh, scanner here, scanner called <coughs> infile. And I'll also set this equal to null to begin with. So the first try catch block was to deal with reading in content, or sorry, opposite of that. <coughs> it was to do writing out content. How to get content out of our program into the text file. The second try catch block is specifically going to be about um, reading in from it, okay? So here, so reading from a file. So here we're going to have another try block. And you can have as many try catch blocks as, as you need inside your program. Um, we're going to say in file is equal to new scanner. So I'm going to do it right, first of all. And then I'm going to start breaking the code just to show you the type of areas you can get it. Okay, so this bit here is to cat is to all actually open up that file and read from it. Um, what I can have then is I can have while in file dot has next line. Let's say string t is equal to uh, in file in file. Dot next line. Uh, I need a counter. Okay, so this is going to loop around 
until there is nothing left inside that buffer, inside the scanner buffer. I have read all the lines of that file. Um, string T, this command here, in file that next line is going to extract out a line of text from the buffer. So the buffer will start very big and it'll shrink from the top. So it's the, the bottom lines are slowly pushing their way up. Um, and every time I read in an A, I'm going to say counter plus plus. Um, <clears throat> and when this loop finishes, I'm going to print out. I don't need this inside here. Uh, that's all I need to do here. So I want to close my in file. So in file dot close. And then I need my catch block. Actually, the exact same as this. Um, and then here I'm going to print out system dot out dot print counter. Okay, so now my code, let me go through the code again. So my code's going to start off by having a scanner for the keyboard. It's going to have a scanner for reading from the file. It's going to have a print writer to write to the file. It's going to have string for user input. It's going to have a counter to count how many bits of user input I have in there. <clears throat> I'm going to have a try catch block here when I try to set up my print writer. My print writer is then going to loop around until I uh, take in inputs from the user until I enter in um, a end of class string. Each time I enter in a value, it's going to write it as a text file. When my loop finishes, I'm going to close that text file. So I'm going to close and save uh, the file. Uh, and this is my catch block in case something goes wrong. Here's where I'm going to read from the file. My initialization of my scanner is going to point my scanner at the file it needs to access. It's going to open that file in. It's going to suck in all of the content from that file. <coughs> and then this loop here is going to take the lines out of that buffer one by one. And for every line I come across, I'm going to increase my counter by one. Um, when I'm finished, I finish dealing with reading from the file, reading from that buffer. So I'm going to close off that. Here's my loop if something's gone wrong, and here's my counter. So hopefully, there's nothing wrong with this code, and it'll run fine, and then we'll start breaking it. Does anyone have any questions before I go on? No? OK. Not really. Not really. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're saving it. So, Java Z uh, test. There's good. Test. So, it opens up my file. It's wiped all of the content in my file. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in Owen, uh, Jeff, Dave, Sue, Harry, Jane. There we go. Ooh. Okay. And now I need to go end. End of class. And it tells me nine. And so if I have a look at that, then I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it includes end of class. But that's fine because what it's actually doing is it's opening up this text file here and it's reading how many individual lines of text I have from there. Okay. Before I go on to another example. So you can write as many uh, names. Mm -hmm. The way this loop is designed is until I enter in the string, it's specifically end of class, all capitals, it will keep taking and taking and taking. That could run for 10,000 entries. Um, there was one year I tried making a, a terrible virus, or I tried getting the students to create a terrible virus, uh, which basically was just a hard drive filler. 
uh, it, it's a, uh, I say it's a terrible virus because it required the victim to compile and run the code. So it's kind of hard to get people to do that. Um, but what it would do is it took a, a dictionary file, so 350,000 English words. It would open up the file. It would read in the first word. It would create a brand new file, so ardvark.txt. It would write out ardvark 10 million times to that file, save it, move on to the next word in the dictionary. It kept going through it. So that I think in five minutes, we'd filled up like 17 gigabytes of data. Just just kept churning and churning and churning. But the way it worked was kind of very similar. It would keep writing to it until either it reached the limit, the number that I was going for, or we got our end of an input key phrase. We actually might do that one now in a couple of minutes, because I'm sure why. Um, OK. Yes, of course. Um, why, is the, why is the print writer set to null? Print writer set to null because it's going to reach out to write to a file. So it's set to null here because when I actually point it at the file, it needs to be inside a try catch block. If I create the print writer inside here, if I wanted to use it again outside the try catch block for whatever reason, it wouldn't exist because it only would exist inside these curly braces here. Okay, so it's just the boundary of it. It's the same way when you create variables inside a method or inside a class, they don't exist outside of it. So null means a way I can create it. It's set up correctly that if for some reason the try block doesn't work, fine, um, but it allows me to uh, use it later on. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so just for the try and catch this. Are they confused when you foresee a possible issue? Yes, and this is this is where your level of experience in programming is probably going to show up. Um, as you get more familiar with programming, you will just learn there are certain scenarios where um, runtime errors are likely. Programming languages will also force you when they think runtime errors are likely. So, for example, if I got rid of the try catch block here. <coughs> So let's put uh, that there and that there. Okay, so I've blocked off that. I only have one try catch block. So print writer has no try catch around it. If I go back here and I compile that, I guess uh, it must be caught or declared as thrown. So the problem is here. There is the possibility that there could be a file not found exception, and Java is not willing to let you risk it. So it's forcing you to use the try catch block. But yes, there are absolutely some circumstances where, do you know what? You learn through experience and you learn through testing. If you, and usually it's it's kind of it's it, it, it's early career programmers, and they're very trusting of their users. And so, oh yeah, of course they're only going to enter in a password that has um, all the required elements, and it's not going to be an insertion attack with SQL. And then you realize, oh, actually, they can enter in. They can enter in a specific combination of characters that will affect my database on my side because I haven't written my code robust enough. And so then the way you fix it is by putting a try catch around it to try to handle stuff like that. But yeah, it's 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 practice and experience. You will learn over time. I need them here. I don't need them here. I can I can write codes to handle like validation. So if you're with a web designer, where you're client side web developer, are you doing some sort of a web form where you need an element of validation? Have you got to that point yet? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And um, you've you've used the web form on the internet where it asks you to enter an email address and you leave out like the dot com on your email address or the at symbol. That's not an email address. So there is there are elements of exception handling like that built into all factors of programming. But when we're dealing with something back end programming like Java, try catches the modern way or is it not modern? Is it the, the standard way of handling that kind of stuff? Any other questions? Okay, let's break this a bit. So I've shown you what happens if I remove the try catch. Um, what also happens, since we're dealing with strings here, is if I do that, okay? So this class test here and this class test here are not the same string. 
I know they're highlighted both in green, but there's no Pod++ plus plus picks up that they're the same collection of characters together. But our, pro, our, our program is going to be case sensitive. So if I change the case or if I get the case wrong, it's going to cause an issue. So if I save this code here, I'm going to run my program. It'll compile absolutely fine. I'm going to run it. It'll run absolutely fine up to a point. Maybe they have changed that. Maybe they've got rid of the case. Sensitive. Right, let's actually just change the file name then. I'll show them. Right. Dave, end of class. Okay. So here's what's happening is when you have the wrong file name, system cannot find specified file. So that's an example of a reading error. So as I said when we were starting this example, a print writer is more robust than a scanner. If you have information you want to put somewhere on the hard drive, you want to save somewhere on the hard drive, and that file doesn't exist, there is a solution around it. Okay, file doesn't exist, no problem. Create a new file, put the information there. Save it. At least we saved the information. Let the user figure out where their file is meant to be, and they can handle that data. If I want to read from a file, and that file doesn't exist, that's a much bigger problem because that data isn't there for me to read. I can't fabricate that data. I can't open up a random file and start reading from it. Okay, so a scanner is not as robust. If the file doesn't exist, well then we have a problem. Um, let's see, okay. What the errors do we have there? Um, Oh yeah, let's get rid of my print right got close. So if I get rid of that, okay, this closes and saves the file. So if I don't have this here, we're going to have an issue with our code. So if I save this, compile and run. Okay, so enter a name, Owen, Dave, Fred, Mary, Sue, Jane. End of class. It tells me zero. There are zero names in that file. If I go and have a look at the file, there are zero names in the file. Because I didn't close my print writer, and because I only wrote a couple of characters, it definitely didn't fill up the buffer. If you think about your first assignment, okay, where you had the, the lamb and the wolf, okay, so way more characters in that than there was in what I wrote. And that still wouldn't have filled the buffer. You can take, um, I have a file on Moodle, which I'll, I'll, I'll open up in a minute. We'll do that stupid virus question in a moment. Um, where you can have a megabyte of a file, a 10 megabyte file, and it's just about reaching the, the size of your buffer. So a couple of names is definitely not going to, it's not going to um, cut it. So as that's sitting there, there's nothing has been pushed out to the file. I don't have the command, the pw.close, to force my code, to, to force my input from the buffer to be pushed out to the text file. So it's never there, so that's why the file looks like it's empty. Now I'd like to save it out. But a problem that I have in this piece of code is that every time I open it up again, hey, every time I open it up again, we are overwriting. It's always overwriting that code, which is really difficult for me to have persistent data. And imagine, there used to be a module where you'd have to write big essay type answers. Uh, you don't have that now. Has Paddy given you a uh, an assignment where you have to write like a, a, a couple of paragraphs on? Let's see, your, your course with you. Have you had to do IEEE 754 yet? Okay, floating point numbers and why someone wrote an 11 page paper on numbers. Um, okay, so imagine you were writing that paper or the answer to that, but you had to write it all in one go. If you went back and went, oh, I want to add an extra paragraph, it wiped everything you had previously written. No one would use that word process. Okay, 
Similarly, our code, if we want to have something where we can keep adding content to it, maybe it's a log file, so we want to keep, we want to work out when uh, people open up applications, when they logged in, when they logged out, and um, how long were they online, type stuff like that. We can write programs to get that information, but if this is meant to be, I mean, if anyone has, I think Android has it, but if anyone has an iPhone, it tells you in the one of the menu, here's your screen time for the day or for the week. And you get these reports going, you're 45 minutes below or seven hours above what you normally are. Okay? Um, the way that's done is it keeps a log of what you've been doing. Well, you're on Instagram for five minutes, you're on emails for 20 minutes, you're on that Candy Crush game for two hours, you're whatever it might be. And so it's keeping track of it. But if we didn't have a way of appending text onto our text file, it would only be the last section. It would only be the last time I went to write the log file it would have. It wouldn't have anything previous to that. So we need to have a way of appending on to our text files. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that, and I'm going to create a brand new file here. I'll call this test2. Test2. And I'm going to get rid of all the reading files. I don't need that yet. And I'm going to get rid of this guy here. And the counter. And I'll fix that and then I'll get rid of all that. Okay. Um, if I want to add it in, let's have a look at the slides for this. I need to, so previously, or up until now, we've been doing this, so we're using our print writer. If I want to append onto it, I need to use a print writer that's also been pointed at a file writer. So my code is now going to look like, rather than this, I'm going to have this, and then here I'm going to have new file writer. And inside these brackets here, I'm going to have the name of the file I'm going to, and then I'm going to have a Boolean flag. Okay, so you can see I still have my text file I'm going to write to, but I also have a Boolean flag here. Um, and what that represents is text file makes, or the, 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 the stream makes sense. It's going to be the text file that I'm writing to. Um, and the Boolean flag, if it's set to true, it means it's going to append, so it's going to add on to the end of that. If it's set, excuse me, if it's set to false, it overwrites it, it wipes the previous version with new data. Okay, so what I can do now <clears throat> is if I save that, okay, uh, I can have here uh, da, da, da. let's see what we can do here. Int i is, e is equal to zero, i is less than ten. All right, plus plus. Inside here, I'm going to say um, system out print on name. Now here at s is equal to kb dot next line. Now pw dot print on s. Okay, so now my try catch block is I'm going to open up my print writer, but I'm going to open it up with the setting that it's going to append onto the previous version. And now it's going to take in 10 names and then automatically shut down. So if I have a look at my, um, where's my file? Close that one up there. And at the moment it's empty, there's nothing in there. <clears throat> so I'm going to. Pilot and Java. Two. Well, so N. Oh, that's not going to use. Hang on. No, if I save the file, it would make much more sense. Now, here we go. Okay, so Owen, Dave, Fred, Mary, Sue. Jane, Luke, 
Uh, Jeff, on again. See. Okay, so that's been entered in there. I go have a look here. I can see all those names are saved. But more importantly, when I go back in here, run the code again, uh, then I can do a different. What's there? What's there? <coughs> So now, if I go into my text file, I can see that it's grown and it's added in the previous. <coughs> so depending on your situation, depending on what you need to do, you can have a simpler piece of code where you just use the print writer and you overwrite what's there each time. Or you can have a slightly more complicated piece of code where you have the print writer, but you also have a file writer where you can append onto it. Um, it also depends on what you're doing. I did for the third assignment for what year was it? A couple of years ago, I gave the third assignment, the one that you're due to get next week, was a game that I asked them to have a high score table on. So that a high score table that had a maximum of 10 high scores. And they need to keep it in order. Highest score at the top, lowest score at the bottom. So what would happen is after the player would finish their game, you would read in the high score file, all 10 lines. You would check to see are any of the, uh, is your current number somewhere in that? Have you like, pushed someone off the high score table? If it is, it's added in, in the correct position, and then you write the whole contents back out the file again. In that scenario, we didn't use append, we use overwrite. Because we wanted to wipe the high score table and write it back out again. There's only 10 lines, very, very simple. Um, if you were doing a word processing program, you definitely would want to use a pen because you'd want to maintain whatever content was previously there beforehand. Um, but then I suppose you could have arguments of do you really want to do that? A log file where it's saying, hey, this today's entry is here. We keep all of yesterday's entries. But maybe actually for a word processing file, you read the whole file into your system memory and you write the whole file out again so if you've made any changes in previous texts let's say spelling errors that type of stuff you might actually want to um <coughs> you might actually want to uh overwrite with the newest version of it. so it depends on the problem it depends on what you've been looking for usually for an assignment so for the assignment you're going to next week for me it probably will involve a pending, but for the class test and for the examination, it's just print writer. Just can you write to a file? That's that's what I'm assessing there. Okay. Anyone have any questions? No. Okay. Uh, right. A couple of things. Text files is pretty much a guaranteed question on the exam paper. At this point in the year, we are three quarters of the way to our course. Every topic we cover from now until the end, we actually have file access this week and next week, and then sorting the week after it. Um, but the stuff we've covered in the second semester, arrays and objects, they are going to be questions on the exam paper. Because of that, I would be advising you to have a look or at the exam papers after we finish a topic and have a look at the type of questions that are asked there. Do you know where to get the exam papers? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you want to move up to exams information. Yeah. If I have a look at exam papers I might have here. Let's see. Let's open up. There, last year's paper. Okay. So this is last year's exam paper for me. Uh, it's the August paper. Uh, so let's have a look and see what the file access question is here. Okay. Question five. Design a program, Java program, to read in a, word, a text file called words.txt and locate the longest word in the file. That first line is all description of the problem you get. Second line is 
have clear design, which we've actually removed this year because you have your system canals to monitor. There won't be any design element in the uh, in the exam for this year because of the module for it. How would you do that? We need to open up a file. We've been told what the file is going to be called. It's going to be called words.txt. So we need to have a scanner that points at that file. Okay, that's step one. There it is, line 28. You change class list.txt to words.txt, that, that part done, okay? You also need to get to that point, you need, actually, do you know what? Let's, let's, let's do that one now, okay? That's an exam question that's worth, in this example here, that's worth 20% of your exam paper, okay? So one-fifth of the exam paper to be able to do a question like this. Um, let's go to... You're going to do revision for your exam? I am, yes. Not today. But... Not today, no, no. <laughs> I want to start for the revision. Can we do, at, at the moment, can we do the response to your past exam question? Absolutely. That's usually what I do is I will take one of last year's exams and I will go through it. Oh. Uh, okay, right. Here is my horrible word file. Um, there are a lot of words inside here. Okay, it's a very big file. Uh, if I save that, it's a desktop, it's called words.txt. Close it down there. Uh, that file is three and a half megabytes. Okay, so in context, class list, which is about 20 names in it, it's got zero bytes, but that's a useless thing. Um, the test Java, right, okay, test Java, which is a plain text file, is four kilobytes, okay? So you've done computer hardware, you are aware of the difference between kilobytes and megabytes, okay? Thousands or millions is essentially what we're looking at here. So 3.54 megabytes means that it is 3.7 uh, million bytes, whereas this is um, 1,000 bytes, exponentially larger. But let's have a look at this file here. So there's our file. It's on the, the desktop. Uh, let's create a brand new file. Let's, we will call this one words. All of these are going to be shown up in the OneDrive, absolutely, yep. Yes, absolutely. I'll put that one up too. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Okay, so words dot Java. Okay, uh, let's get rid of the bits we don't need. We don't need that. We actually don't need any of this because it was the other file I was meant to read from. So we need a scanner. Let's do it by hand. So inside here, I have a scanner in file, which is going to be equal to null for, to begin with. And I'm also going to need a string here uh, called longest. And I'll set that equal to zero to begin with. And um, I'm going to have my try block. I'm going to say in file, so you the new scanner, uh, new file. Words.txt. Okay. So what I've got so far is I've got my imports up at the top, and I've got my scanner declared here, and my scanner set up here, and it's inside a try block. I'm also going to need my catch block at the bottom. Uh, so catch. Read. Exception. Me. Uh, here I'm just going to system dot out dot Okay, 
Here's my catch block as well. So far, where we are, we've done that much. We've done half of the problem so far. I need a way of going through the words. So I need a way of going through to the words. So here I'm going to have while ooh, while in file dot has next next line. Okay, so that loop is going to read through the entire 3.5 megabytes of that file. At the very end, I need uh, in file stuff close. Okay. Ignoring what the program is actually asking me to do beyond open up a text file and read from it. The specifics for that question five from last year's August paper. We have all of the text file stuff done at this point, really. Okay? Um, if I really want to be pedantic about it, I suppose I could actually take temp is equal to in file dot next line. I do that. Okay, now there is nothing else that I'm going to do in this program that's actually related to text files. I would advise that if you feel comfortable with string manipulation, okay, and we spent a long time doing that, you should absolutely be focusing on doing the text file question in manage. Because the text file part of it, it's not that big. But yes, there's stuff you need to remember to do. You need to remember your imports. You need to remember to declare your scanner as null. You need to have a try-catch block. You need to handle the catch in a certain way. You need to close your scanner. You need to have a way of processing through it. But that's quite formulaic. In the same way that a string manipulation question is very often take that string and go character by character until the end. An array question is take that array and go index by index until the end. With all of the topics we've looked at, there are patterns that you can you can identify to help you when you have a blank piece of paper in front of you to get started on that solution. Um, if you're working from home on an assignment, I'm assuming that if you get stuck, oh, I can't remember to do that. You don't just stare at a blank screen. You go back and look at previous examples or you look at the notes. You don't have that in an examination. You don't have that in a class test. But what you do have is you have patterns that I have repeated over and over and over again that are really good starting points. You're given a blank page and you've no other access to other notes or anything else. It's a good way of starting. So yes, you need to remember elements for text files, obviously. That's where we're assessing we do the examination. But there's not a massive amount of it there. Okay, so that's my text file part. Nothing new there. I've basically just taken test one as a program, and I have changed the file I'm looking at. That's all. Rather than class list.txt, it's just words.txt. Code's almost identical. Now that I have a way of doing that, how would I find the longest word in that file? I've removed all the text file part of it, so now it's a string manipulation. How would I check how long a word is? If you've got a loop that goes from the first character to the last character in the string, how do you know when you're at the end of the string? Huh? Dot length. Dot length. Yes, dot length. I didn't hear what was said over here, so if it said dot length, you were right as well. If you didn't, you were right. Um, yes, dot length. Dot length will tell you the size of that string. It returns back an integer. How do you tell which integer is larger? It's a, it's a simple numerical calculator or comparison at that point. So what I would do is, and we've done, I mean, you, you did in your first assignment, tell me the longest word, tell me the longest sentence. So you've done this already, you've done the search and true to find the longest word. 
the only difference here is that we're going to have a load of um, strings that we're going to pass through. But the strings are just one word at a time. So here we're going to have longest starts off at empty. We're going to have our info here reading the first string, which is going to be aardvark. And we have the length of string of temp, or we get the length of longest. If longest is shorter than temp, well, temp is now the new longest string. Okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to say uh, if temp dot length is greater than longest dot length, well, then we find a new longest. So longest is equal to temp. And that is it. At the very end of this, I'm going to need to print out system dot out dot print longest. So I actually tell you what the word is. But that's it. That is actually all the code we need. This loop is the processing power. So Three and a half megabytes of a file, 10 megabytes of a file, a gigabyte of a file, doesn't matter. Remember what computers are brilliant at? Repetitive tasks, stuff that we wouldn't do as humans. We're not going to go and check 350,000 words and go figure out which is the largest one. We're going to get someone else to automate it. This is the automation. If there's, a, if there's a word left in that text file, get that word, check that word, see if there's another word. If, if that word is longer, well, then that's the new longest word. Keep going until you get to the end. When you get to the end, close the file and print out whatever that word is. So let's, let's double check this works. And it will take a little bit of time to run because. Yeah, the longest equal with the time, which means. Sorry, yeah, so if the, if the length of our temp, so the current word in our text file, is longer than what we previously had thought was the longest word, well then that string is the new value of our longest word. So for the very first thing that's going to happen, we have an empty string and we have the word aardvark, which has got six letters in it. So is zero bigger than six? No. So aardvark is now our longest word. But when we come across a, a larger word, well then that will get aardvark replaced with that. Okay, so uh, here. Uh, CLS, clear that. No, CLS. Gene, there we go. Right, Java C. Words. Da, 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 da. Oh, these are strings. <sighs> Doing an arrays later on. Okay, save. Right. Words. Now, it's a large program. I'm going to guess that's a real word. <laughs> it's definitely a long word. Uh, let me actually see if that exists. I, I'm not even going to search. I'm going to, do, I'm going to do a find and replace or a find here. So words. Take a minute to look. It's so large that it takes several seconds for this to be opened up. Um, and if I search for that, Okay, yeah, it does exist. Um, if I open this up in Word, yeah, yeah, so there you get the, the individual ones. Okay, so you can see all the words there, and it's literally doing that. So it goes from an empty string to aardvark, it goes from aardvark to aardvarks because that's one character longer. It goes from aardvarks to aardwolves. I have no idea what an aardwolf is. And then it keeps going down to probably uh, have a connection. And it keeps working down and working down and working down. But break down what we've done. <clears throat> we have a way of reading a text file. It doesn't matter what the problem is, if it involves reading a text file, basically the code's going to be the same. We have a way of telling how long a particular string is. And we have a way of keeping a record of what's the longest string we found. If I remove the text files out of that problem, and I said, here, 
you're going to be supply here. Design a method to take in a massive string full of words and tell me what's the longest word in that. You've already done that. You do that as a sign of one. Okay. The only way this looks more difficult is because you're using a text file, but the text file is quite manageable. Okay. And yes, I will put this up on one drive in a minute. Any questions on that one? That was a particularly unusual. Actually, you know what? No, it wasn't unusual. The normal, not normal, the, the more the more traditional type of questions that I'd ask uh, are uh, let's see, 2017. <laughs> No. And what if the words were separated by space? Are you pardon? If the words were separated by space. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I think in that particular exam paper, I think there was an appendix that had here's a sample of the words. You can see they're all on new lines. Uh, in this example here, it's basically the exact same. Um, it's the exact same question. I've just phrased it differently. Create a program that takes a string in from the user and checks it against a dictionary file to see if the word's spelled correctly. So we're not checking length now, we're now checking the dot equals command, but it's exact, apart, if you change that, if longest dot length is, is shorter than temp dot length to if longest dot equals temp, code's almost identical. Uh, you can assume the dictionary file is called words.txt, it's located in the same uh, file, it's got 350,000 unique words, one word per line. So I do give you usually a bit of information to clarify what's happening in it. Um, okay, not that one then. Uh, let's open up this one here. Yeah, there's it. Okay. So. Here's the other type of question I ask, where you open up one text file and you write to another text file. So design a Java program to read in a text file called movie.txt and write it to another file called goodmovies.txt. Each line of the input file has a 0 to 10 rating and a movie title, which are separated by a space. So you have a 9.2, a space, and the name of the file, 8.9, a space, and the name of the file, and so on. The lines have no extra spaces at the beginning or at the end, and the program should only, your, your program should only write out those records who have a rating equal to or greater than eight. So for example, Shawshank, Dark Knight from Hell, all get written out, Skyfall does not, okay? Take away the file access element of this. You are taking a string, you are checking for a criteria in a specific location. You know it's going to be the first three or four characters. If it's 0, 0.0 to 9.9, .9, it's the first three characters. If it's 10.0, which is a maximum rating, it's four characters. You know that after the number, there will be a space. So the very first space you encounter is the space in between the number and the thing. And what you need to write out is everything on the right hand side of that space. Okay, ignoring the file access, get a string, get the index of the space. So the first time the space occurs, starting on the left hand side, counting across. If the index is equal to 2, 0, 1, 2, that means that it is a, um, that, that's your numbers there. If it's equal to 3, it means it's a, a 10 range. So you know how to truncate it. So you can get the first three and you can check to see if that's going to be greater than or less than. You can actually simplify it even further. You can take the very first character. If the first character is equal to eight, you're going to automatically put that file in. Because that goes from 8.0 up to 9.9. .9. So if it was eight or greater, so eight or zero. If it's equal to one, you need to check the next character to see if it's a zero. If it's a zero, it means you've got a 10. If it's not a zero, the only other option is it's going to be a point, which means you're not going to write that. It's a one point rating count. So, ignoring the, the file access, we have string manipulation. 
And if you go back and have a look at all the passing towns that are available, that's kind of how they fall into categories. Text file access, either reading or writing or both, with some string manipulation or string comparison. Okay, so string stuff we've done loads of. That should be pretty comfortable for you guys to do. So all you need to do is remember the pattern for how do I write to a, to a file, how do I read from a file. And I will give you practice on that as we go along. Fair enough? Okay, we will finish up there for today. Does anyone have any questions before we finish up? Okay, uh, I'm intending to get the zombie dice stuff corrected uh, before I see you next, so you'll have results then back. Uh, a reminder again that we are still going for the middle of April for one book two. However, if you've got it done, I will still advise you, get it out of the way. Submit it so you can forget about it. If you haven't got it done yet, no worries. You have it in the middle of April. It gives you approximately another 20 days. Yeah, April. I think that's what I said. Did I say the middle of April? Yeah. yeah. So let, let's say the middle, let's say the 15th of April, that's where we're going to go for as your, your submission for it. So it's you've covered all the content. It's stuff, it's a, it's a worksheet you were meant to have over the New Year's break, and I forgot to give it to you. So nothing new in there at all. Okay. All right, folks, I will see you next week. And feel free to.